So we'll start with a French physicist called Louis de Broglie. In 1924, he postulated that electrons have a wave nature. He was inspired by light, which is also dualistic in nature, in the sense that in some situations, light is best explained as a waveform. So here we have planar light waves incident on a slit, and we get diffraction occurring, characteristic of wave-like nature. But also sometimes light behaves like a particle, such as in the photoelectric effect, where we have packets of energy, packets of light called photons, which can be incident on a surface and have electrons emitted from the surface. That's the photoelectric effect, best explained by light being explained as a particle. Now, Louis de Broglie basically said that that kind of wave-particle duality seen for light should also hold for electrons, or indeed particles in general. This was his very simple equation. The wavelength of an electron lambda is given by a constant, Planck's constant, divided by the momentum of the electron, which is its mass times its velocity. Now, remarkably, this was demonstrated experimentally by Sir George Paget Thompson and also by Davison, where they showed that a beam of electrons would actually give rise to a diffraction pattern when passing through a crystal. So as a result, Louis de Broglie in 1929 received the Nobel Prize for Physics for his discovery of the wave nature of electrons. And indeed, the experimentalists also shared a Nobel Prize in 1937. So Schrodinger then devised a wave equation for these matter waves, for these particle waves. And in fact, the interesting fact is that when you solve Schrodinger's equation, and we'll get into it briefly in this video, then quantization, for example, of energy levels in a hydrogen atom, whereby we see these discrete um, wavelengths of light that are emitted, the quantization of the hydrogen atom is directly explained by solving the Schrodinger equation. Okay, let's start off then with a basic model of um, an electron as a wave. So here then we have a proton, um, a hydrogen atom with an electron orbiting the proton. And normally we consider it as a particle, but now we're gonna consider this blue waveform as a cosine function describing the electron as a wave function per psi, as a function of position x around that circular orbit, a very simple model here. We've got amplitude a, and then we've got this factor k here, which we're gonna be calling the spatial frequency or the angular wave number. Okay, let's take a look at what that means. It's telling us the number of wavelengths of that electron that fit within an interval 2 pi. So graphically then, we have the wavelength going from peak to peak, um, the wavelength of the um, electron here, and we've got a certain number of those wavelengths that fit within 2 pi. Hence, k is simply 2 pi divided by lambda. And what that means is that if lambda is large, then k is small, or if k is large, then lambda is small. So k reflects the number of these wavelengths fitting within a certain interval 2 pi. Okay, now just to point out that wave functions, um, such as cosines or sine functions, are not quite as simple as they first appear. So I'm showing here that if we add together sinusoidal functions like cosines or sines with particular wave numbers k and with varying amplitudes of those sines and cosines, then in fact we can build up very general functions indeed. And so I just want to point out that we're not restricting ourselves if we just consider a simple cosine function, because what we'll be showing is that the cosine function is a solution, is a solution to the Schrodinger equation, um, but then likewise, many such different cosines and sines can be solutions to the Schrodinger equation, and they can all be added together in superposition to solve the Schrodinger equation as well, because it's a linear equation. Right, let's get back then to Louis de Broglie's equation. Lambda is h over p. In other words, p equals h over lambda. Now here, to make use of that angular wave number k, 2 pi over lambda, I'm now going to divide h by 2 pi. And I'm going to label h divided by 2 pi as the reduced Planck's constant, um, which we can be called, which we can call h bar or h cross. And therefore, we've got momentum p 
is equal, momentum P is equal to H cross K. So the momentum of the electron is proportional to the angular wave number or the spatial frequency by making use in particular of this H cross constant. Okay, let's get back then to that simple expression. What I'm now going to show is a very important property of cosine and sine sinusoidal functions, which is that when we differentiate them twice, we end up with effectively the same function, which is a very important property. Let's see that in action now. First of all, the first spatial derivative, cosine derivative with respect to x is minus sine. Then we've got to multiply by the derivative of kx, so that's just simply k. Let's take the second spatial derivative. Now the sine goes to a cosine function, sine goes to cosine function, and now we've got to multiply again by the derivative of the um, argument of the trigonometric function. In other words, just by the chain rule of differentiation, we've got to multiply by the derivative of kx, that's just k again. So we've got minus a k squared cosine kx. And now let's take a look at what's happened here. Effectively then, the second derivative of the wave function is just equal to the original wave function itself, psi of x, just multiplied by minus k squared. Now that holds for sines, for cosines, and indeed for complex exponentials as well, which I'm showing on the right-hand side. Feel free to pause the video and check that for yourself. Let's move on then to now consider the total energy of an electron in orbit of a proton in a hydrogen atom. We can say the kinetic energy of that electron is the well-known half mv squared. Now, if we multiply top and bottom of this expression by m, then we get m squared v squared over m. In other words, p squared, because p is equal to mv. Now, what have we just shown before? We have shown with de Broglie's formula that the momentum p is h cross k, and therefore we can plug that into this expression to say that the kinetic energy of the electron is h cross squared k squared divided by 2m. Now let's go back to our total energy expression, substitute in for the kinetic energy, and then rearrange that so e minus u times 2m over h cross squared is equal to k squared. So why have we done that? Well, you might remember just a moment ago, we looked at the wave function, we took its second derivative, and what was the constant here, the proportionality factor? It was minus k squared. And we've just got this beautiful expression for k squared in terms of the particle's total energy and its potential energy. Okay, so let's substitute that in here. And uh, that's a very simple direct substitution for k squared. Then let's rearrange that. So I've put the 2m down here, h cross squared up there, minus over to the other side of the expression. Now, if we rearrange that, look what we get. We obtain the time-independent Schrodinger equation basically saying that the kinetic energy plus the potential energy is equal to the total energy. Now, this is just the 1D version with no time dependence, and it's only in 1D, not in 2D or 3D, and hence we've used full derivatives here in this expression. Now, the amazing thing is, if you solve that equation in 3D in spherical polar coordinates, then the Schrodinger equation directly predicts that you would get discrete energy um, levels of a hydrogen atom. Now, previously it was Niels Bohr who postulated that we had these energy quantum numbers, the principal quantum number n, and then Sommerfeld had to extend that to account for what happens in electric fields. He had to extend it again to account for what happens in magnetic fields, where basically the hydrogen line spectra were splitting with extra lines visible. So we had these kind of extra quantum numbers in old quantum theory that had to be put forward but Schrodinger with his equation, which we've just briefly looked at when solved in 3D, naturally gives rise to these integer values for n, l, and m in just the right numbers that correspond directly to experimental evidence for the spectra of hydrogen atoms. So there were no more ad hoc assumptions as in the old quantum theory. And furthermore, if you really look into it, the Schrodinger equation also directly predicts the number of electrons that can be um, obtained at any given particular energy level or orbital around an atom. So a very impressive outcome for the Schrodinger equation. Thank you very much for listening.